Well, Hashem, welcome to everyone here. We're now on our fourth lesson of Liquid Moran. Tonight's lesson is entitled The Battle of Malchut. And in with every lesson, we're going to begin with a review and we'll be so that everyone will feel like they're on the same page. And we'll get you back briefly what we covered the first three lessons so we can have a continuation of our learning because it's built up level on level. Okay. So, Bezat Hashem, we're currently learning Likute Moran, Book One, Discourse One. Rabbi Nachman calls the discourses his Torahs. It's each one Torah One, Torah Two, Torah Three. So, when we say Torah One, we refer to Discourse One. Okay, so we're now in Torah One, and we're learning how to pray effectively, and we're learning how to illuminate the darkness in our lives, and how to get closer to Hashem. Uh, we have to keep this in mind because it's important when you learn Likute Moran and to learn it effectively, uh, you have to maintain focus and to, you know, what I'm doing, what I'm, what I'm learning, because Rabbi Nachman's teachings are not coffeehouse philosophy, uh, but they're hands-on spiritual guidance that illuminate the lives and makes absolutely necessary for a happy life and for a meaningful life. So to glean his teachings, and to internalize them and be able to turn them into practical improvement in our life, uh, we have to delve into deep context, deep concepts in Talmud and Kabbalah, because Rebbe's, Rebbe Nachman's teachings, at their high level, they have a type of magic in them, where no matter what your spiritual level is, you can see them on your own level. But some people make the mistake uh, when Rebbe Nachman makes a uh, referral to, to Talmud or to Kabbalah, they get to deep into the detail and uh, they see, oh, there, there's a, a, a fir tree and there's a pine tree and there's an oak tree. Oh, where are you, sir? He doesn't notice that he's in the forest. He forgets where he is. So we cannot run the focus of what we're doing and what we're learning and why we're learning. Okay, so that's why we have to maintain focus and all the time remind us our focus where we're going and what we're doing. Uh, people, they go off on a tangent because there's so much information to learn in Rabbi Nachman's teachings. All right. So our broad question we have to ask us, we're learning Rabbi Nachman's teachings. What does Rabbi Nachman want from us? Because Rabbi Nachman is just not out there to flaunt his knowledge. Rabbi Nachman is a great grandson of the Baal Shem Tov. He tells the Baal Shem Tov his entire mission is to bring every human on the world closer to the Almighty. That's it. And that, that way, each one of us individually, we're help. We feel better, and we're healthier. We feel better emotionally. We feel better spiritually. We feel better physically. And each one of us got a smile on our faces. Then the world has a smile on its face, harming the world. Okay, so let's go back to what we learned in lesson one. Lesson one, we learned that the Torah gives charm to our prayers and requests. We made a differentiate between prayers and requests. Prayers are when we praise the Almighty, requests and we ask for what we personally need in our lives our spiritual needs, our physical needs, and nothing is too big or small. Whether you're asking the Almighty for a new house or asking for a shoelace, nothing in life is too big or too small to ask. Okay, now the reason that the anti immuna forces in the world have all the prestige and we don't is because we don't have enough illumination of Torah, and that's another than divine light. So this is going to be the war that we'll talk about today. This is a light, the war between light and darkness. So when the light is too weak, then darkness darkness prevails. Now, in lesson two, Rabbi Nachman answers that each must each one of us, in order to get this charm, to get our prestige, that each one of us has to connect to the inherent wisdom in each creation. And that way we connect to the Almighty, because the Almighty used his divine wisdom in creating every creation. And we do that. How do we connect to the divine wisdom? We do that by looking at the creation's inner dimension, not its outer physicality. We spoke about how if you look at people and if you look at their physicality, you look at their height, their, their weight, their fatness, in there, they've got uh, you know, the, the color of their skin, the, 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 whether their eyes are round or slant or whatever, that's differentiated. But the body, the body is comes from the side of evil. And the body, when we bodily oriented, there's war, there's strife. Uh, you can't even within one nation can't get along one another. But when we look at the soul, the inner part, the soul, just like spiritual gravity is uplifting, physical gravity pulls you down. The body is physical gravity that pulls you down. And 
the soul, the spiritual gra- gravity that's uplifting. So when we look at the soul, we look at each person's soul, we connect to the divine wisdom in that person. It's the same in every other creation. Uh, we spoke about the four levels of creation that the Arizal teaches us in Kabbalah. It's called the Datscham, Domem, the mineral level, Tzemach, the plant level, Chai, the animal level, and Medabel, the human level. And each level, a, a rock, a rock has a divine soul because if the rock didn't have a divine soul, it would cease to exist. Everything has a life force, and the life force is that divine wisdom that the Almighty instills in every creature. That's the inherent divine wisdom, what Rabbi Nachman calls the sechel bukal deval, the inherent wisdom in everything. Okay, so we said even a rock has this, and we all have to look for this intrinsic divine wisdom in each creation. Because when we do, we get a completely different view of life, a completely different understanding of things. And when we connect to that, we connect to the vitality of every creation. This illuminates our souls. This gives us vitality because this is vitality from the Holy One. This is a divine, divine light. That's one of the greatest vitality there is. So now we learned in lesson three last week that because divine light, it's so dazzlingly bright. And it's so blindingly bright, you can't contain it. We can't just say it. it's like looking at the sun, the, the damage your, your eyes. Uh, so we have to prepare ourselves as proper spiritual vessels to receive this amazing light. Okay, now at this point, we had to brief ourselves with the 10 spheres of godliness that we learn in Kabbalah. And the uppermost sphere is Chachma, which is wisdom. We said the people said, what about Keter? What about the, the crown? That's above and beyond our understanding. The Keter, the crown, that is godliness that we have no, cannot fathom. That, that's way, way, way a bit of a beyond. In the 10 spheres, it begins below the crown, below Keter, and it starts with Chochmah, which is wisdom. Wisdom is the top sphere. And then it goes all the way down. Chochmah, Bina, Das, Chesed, Gvura, Tiferes, Netzachod, Yesod, Malchut. goes down. The 10th sphere is Malchut. That's kingship. Okay, now the kingship, the malchut, has no light of her own. And chachma is it's compared, the moon is symbol, symbolic of malchut because it has no light of its own. And the sun is symbolic of chachma because it is the source of light, the source of this blinding light. Now, when the source of light, the sun, illuminates the moon, then the moon is capable of being very, very bright. And we learned that the moon knows how to do great things with the sun's light, just like the malchut. When it gets the illumination from Chochmah, then it does great things on, on, on each level. Now, on our level, this is each one of us has a potential for harnessing divine wisdom. In other words, each one of us has, uh, let's use a, use a, a uh, metaphor of electricity. Okay, so it says some of us are have a 40 watt, soul, some of us have a 60-watt soul, some of us have a 100-watt soul. But each of us has a potential of much, much, much more. In other words, the more we develop our amuna, the more we develop ourselves as vessels for stronger divine light. I'll give you an example. that We've been learning amuna for a long time together in amuna hour, and you see the growth of people, and people way, which that they started as, as 40 watt light bulbs, and today they're 500 watt light bulbs. And so that's so much happier, so much closer to the Almighty. And this is what Rabbi Nachman is talking about. So just imagine that uh, the Almighty is not doing us a favor. Oh, Hashem, illuminate my life. Okay, if someone wants more divine light, one more happy, person wants more divine light, one more happiness, more closeness to Hashem. Shem's not doing a favor to a 40-watt light bulb if he zaps it with two gigawatts. And two gigawatts are, are, are 2 billion watts. Now, 2 billion watts is what the an average city power plant is capable of producing. And it can uh, illuminate a few thousand houses. All right. Now, it doesn't take the power, the two gigawatts, and put it right in your 40-watt light bulb because not it would explode. Your, your whole house, the, your circuit breaker would explode. Okay, so what you have to do is we learned in last week's lesson, uh, people get mixed up and confused, and they see the 10 spheres, and they think, but we, we learned in the, in the Shema that uh, here, O Israel, the Lord, the Lord is one, yes, and we learned in our principle, the second principle of Amunah, we learned the 13 principles of Amunah, that in, in Amunah hour, 
that there's no oneness like the oneness of God. So what's this 10 spheres all about? People get mixed up. But what, what, what's the 10 spheres? What's the difference between this part? With the, there's, there's, there's more parts to, to Hashem? No, no, no. That's 10. If you take the power station that it's producing those two gigawatts, okay, everything. Now, it goes through a series, a whole series of reductions, what's called constrictions in Kabbalah. They're called simtsumim. Electricity works just like Kabbalah. Okay, so it goes through a few constrictions because the, the massive power that's produced in the power plant cannot reach the light bulb in your living room. So what does the electric company have to do to get that massive electricity into your power plant, into, into your, your, your light bulb? It has to go through a series of reductions, and it goes from uh, a series of constrictions, starts at the power plant. Then it's relayed to a transformer, the transformer that the voltage brought way, way down. And then from the transformer, it goes to transmission lines. Again, it's brought way, way down. From the transmission lines, it goes to the voltage regulator at the entrance to your home. And then it goes to the your, your circuit, when you have whatever you have your circuit breaker or your fuse box. And from then down to your light bulb. So the two gigawatts now become the 40 or 60 or 100 watt light bulb. But just as the two gigawatts are electricity, the light in your light bulb is electricity. It's all electricity. It's one electricity. There's no other point. This is all electricity. This is godliness. Just as we have the fantastic, glamoring uh, splendor of illumination and chokhmah and wisdom, it comes the same illumination, the same godliness that illuminates down here in each one of us, in each one of our souls, each one of our 90, 40, 60, or 100 watt souls. Okay, so now our job is to become stronger spiritual vessels. And this is what Rebbe Nachman is helping us to do. Okay, now for us to become stronger spiritual vessels, all well and done, but now we're going to, how are we going to do it? We have to strengthen ourselves in Torah. We have to strengthen ourselves in prayer. And we have to strengthen ourselves in Amuna. And that's what we're doing separately on Amuna or the, the group. We straight, we're in Amuna all the time, strengthening ourselves in Amuna and all the facets of Amuna. By the way, Amuna is a mitzvah for all of humanity. All of humanity. We're all required to, to know Amuna. So that's why this is universal. And for every single person. Okay, so what happens now? We now have a war within us. Uh, the body has its physical desires. And in order to get closer to Hashem and to increase our capacity for receiving divine light, as a vessel for divine light, we have to nullify the body to the soul because the soul, the spirit pulls us up, the body pulls us down. And that's the personal refinement that enables each one of us to improve our lives, bring us closer to Hashem. So when we're striving to get closer to Hashem, we become the aspect of Jacob. We get the light of Jacob. When we give into the body and we look at the neighbor's spouse or we cover the neighbor's possessions or uh, go against the, the no-hide laws to, to, to grab more money or to do something else, all things that, that we, we spoke about on the moon hour, comes Esau. Esau and Jacob are the eternal good and evil that are fighting for to the end. So this, this is a battle. And when people look for easy life, path of least resistance, you cannot have an easy life and a path of least resistance and get closer to Shem because there's dark side, there's opposition in the field. Ask a Super Bowl player or a Mundial footballer doesn't have an easy life in the, in the finals. The Pro Bowl is not an easy game. These guys get hit really hard, okay? Because if it was an easy game, then it would, wouldn't be worth to win the championship. The championship that each one of us is trying to win to overcome the evil inclination, this is the greatest championship of ever. And you cannot imagine the pomp and ceremony awards, see, Super Bowl night, Super Bowl awards. You have no idea. If you take the Super Bowl night and Super Bowl rewards and multiply that by about a a hundred thousand times, that's what the successful soul 
that fought this battle down on this earth, maybe think you're not winning, but just by fighting it, it is so much satisfaction to the to the Almighty. It says, look, the soul is fighting the forces of evil, which are angels, the dark side angels, just to get close to me. Okay, so the Almighty is, is it, he's enjoying your courage. He's enjoying your heroism. And whoa, you, what a reward, you can't even imagine the reward. Okay, so this is the metaphor of Torah. It really happened, but it's also a metaphor for posterity, the battle between Esau and Jacob. Now, Esau and Jacob, what's the metaphor? The metaphor, they fought all night long, all night long. What's the night mean? The night means this world is darkness because we don't see divine light. We can't see divine light. It's sealed. Olam is the Hebrew word for word for world. That's this world, olam. But uh, disappearance is helim. So it's the same root word. So the word in the holy tongue of Hebrew, which is the, the tongue of holiness, this is the tongue of, of Torah, the tongue of Kabbalah. When we say olam, we are talking about a place, the only place in the entire realm, spiritual realm. This is the lowest place in the entire spiritual realm, the physical earth. There's no place lower. Uh, purgatory is higher because in purgatory, even the, all the evil souls, that they, they know they know that Hashem is the real deal. And they know what they're doing down in purgatory because of what I did. It's so on a spiritual level, purgatory is higher than the physical world because the physical world, Hashem's light is concealed. Lem means concealment, disappearance. And this is Olam. This is the realm of concealment where divine light is concealed. And this is what Rabbi Nachman is teaching us, that we have to look for the wisdom in everything. We have to cut through the concealment. Don't pay attention. Rabbi Nachman tell throughout his teachings, don't pay attention to the obstacle. The obstacle is a mirage. The obstacle is a figment of the mind. Hashem puts the obstacles there so that we'll overcome them. And Hashem wants us to overcome them. And he gives us the power to overcome them. That's what we have to understand. So when Jacob is fighting Esau's angel all night long, Esau's angel, this is the evil inclination incarnate. Jacob is every one of us when he's fighting. The, the, this is the Israelite that we talked about in lesson one. When he's fighting the angel all night long, that means in this world, and you know, the angel gave in to Jacob at daybreak. Daybreak is the moment that the soul leaves the body and it goes right into the next world. And then if that soul was a righteous soul that was trying to learn a moon and trying to get close to the Almighty, that soul prevails and, and the angel gives in. The angel completely gives up. He says, let me go. You, you won. You won. That's it. He gives in. This is a metaphor for all our lives. It is the war between. Jacob and Esau. And that's what we're talking about this week. Now we go on to lesson four and we continue. And Rabbi Nachman is talking about this war. This is the war of Malchut. It's the war. Is the moon going to be dark or the moon going to be light? Will the moon receive the light of the sun or will the moon be dark? The moon is our souls. That's Malchut. Or Malchut. And that down here, Malchut is also Emunah. Emunah is in Malchut. Are we going to activate it and illuminate it or not? So really in brief, what Rabbi Nachman is teaching us this week, Rabbi Nachman is teaching us that as the more the body prevails, the more the soul remains in darkness. The more the soul prevails, then the more the soul receives this divine illumination. And it's so beautiful and so satisfactory. So Rabbi, said, Rabbi Nachman says, here you are from last week, without in our part four, Aval Misha Eno Mikashel that's Mola Sekhova Chokma Bakyuchesh Bakoldaval. First I read this in Hebrew, get my head, then then I translate it in my this is not a an Oxford or Webster version translation. This is a laser translation because the translations you can't trans I can't do a Google translation of Likute Moran. Have to understand what Rabbi Nachman wants of the messages. That's why I say I read it in Hebrew and go again. If you read Hebrew and you have a copy of Likutei Moran, you can follow along. We're now in the second letter of Torah, Aleph. Okay, the Torah. But Rabbi Nachman told us to connect, but the person who opts not to connect to the inherent divine wisdom in everything, 
This is an Esau. That's an Esau that disparages the birthright. What's the birthright? We'll just soon explain what Rabbi Nachman means by the birthright. Like it's written in the Torah, the 25th chapter of Genesis, look at, at passage number 24. And Esav disparaged the birthright. He sold his birthright. His birthright uh, was his right to serve Hashem on a higher level than the second. The, the oldest son before the golden calf, the oldest son was the son that would participate in the uh, ritual sacrifices, special work of Hashem. But, but after the golden calf, the oldest son, the Bechor, was replaced by the Levites because the Levites did not participate in the golden calf. The Levites became chosen tribe, that they were chosen to work in the Holy Temple and to do the jobs of the Holy Temple. And the core of the Levites, the, the high priests, the Kohanim, they come from the Levite family. But they do this, they have their special jobs, and the Levites, they have their special jobs. But this is all the Levites and the Kohens. It used to be, it used to be the firstborn. Before the, before the giving of Torah and Mount Sinai, it was the firstborn. Esau was the firstborn. Esau sold his birthright to Jacob. He was hungry. He came back in one day, Rashi explains to us. He came back, he was, he killed a person. He was running another guy's wife. Uh, he was out hunting. He was doing all types. Of, he did five major sins in one day. And he came back hungry. And uh, he said to Jacob, uh, oh, I need something. Jacob was prepared. He prepared some lentils for his father because this was the day Abraham died. This was the day Abraham died. Esau and Jacob, they were twins. They were 15. Uh, Abraham died. Hashem took Abraham away so he would not see his grandson Esau's evil, that they, it would have broken Abraham's heart. So Abraham died before Esau came home and all this evil was revealed. So he came home hungry and he saw that Jacob prepared a bowl of lentils for his father because lentils is it's a little round beans. And uh, we eat this is one of the things that mourners eat. Mourners eat uh, hard boiled eggs, they eat lentils, the beans, little round things. This is symbolic that the world is round. It's symbolic of the life cycle. So Jacob cooked some. This is mourner's food. He cooked for his father, Isaac. Isaac was in mourning for his father, Abraham, which is Jacob's grandfather. Comes Esau, and he was hungry. He wants this food. He says, uh, give, give me the, those red lentils. He says, give me some of that red stuff. And that's why they call Esau Edom. Edom and he means red. And Edom, the Edomites, the land of Edom, that comes from Esau. That was his tribal land. And Rome comes from Edom. Rome is descendants of Esau. Uh, the Germans are descendants of Esau. The Nazis are descendants of Esau. Uh, okay, this is uh, the Gomorrah and Tractate Megillotos. So Esau said, he says, I'm hungry. And he said, Jacob says, well, what do you give me? He says, I'll give you my birthright. I don't need that stupid birthright. If, stupid birthright. The birthright is a privilege of serving Hashem more than anyone else. And this Tim was a stupid, he didn't need that. He needs a bow, he needs an arrow, he needs another guy's wife. This was Esau. This is Esau. He's all body, 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 evil, evil, evil. So Jacob rightly bought the birthright. And this was Esau's disparagement of the birthright that he sold it for a loaf of bread and a bowl of lentils. Okay, so this is Vayivez, Esau at the Porah, and Esau dis dis disparaged the firstborn. And so what is Rebbe Nachman telling us? What's this firstborn? He says, we connect to Jacob, we become the firstborn. What is the firstborn? It's our right to the divine wisdom. You become a Jacob. Now you plug into divine wisdom. You try and make your soul stronger than your body and get closer to Hashem and say, wait a second. Okay, if I've got this, I'm not supposed to steal and I'm not supposed to covet and I'm not supposed to lie and I'm not supposed to blaspheme. I'm not all these but I do, I've got, I've got to pray, I've got to strengthen my amuna. I've been in Hashem. Oh, you're a Jacob? Guess what? You get more divine light because you are looking for the divine wisdom in everything. This Rabbi Nachman tells us. As soon as a person opts to look at the divine wisdom and look at the internal dimension of something, rather than look at the physicality, the outer dimension of something that 99.5% of modern society does, then you become Jacob. So look, look, look what the odds are. Look at the odds are. You get 0.5% of society, and I think I'm exaggerating there, but let's say that is searching to get close to the Almighty. And don't 
be mistaken. Uh, most religious people have no idea about what we're talking here. They, they're religion, okay, religion. Religion is a, a ritual here and a ritual there. And then going to house of worship here and going to house of worship there has nothing to do. You see, if a religious person doesn't have a smile on his face, person that doesn't have a smile on his face, there's no divine illumination. Because there's a person that divine illumination, he's got to have a, he's got a smile on his face. And when he looks at the, the wisdom in every, in every person, every creation, wow, look how special Hashem made that person. Wow. Look what I have to learn from this person. Wow, look at this person. Oh, wow. This is, the Ugandans, they, they're, they're wonderful people. The, the Romanians, they're wonderful people. This is a wonderful person. This, if you look for the divine wisdom, wait a second. What's so special about the Chinese? What's so special about the Japanese? What's so special about the Filipinos? What's so special about, uh, about a, a quartz crystal? What's so special about a frog? What's so special about a frog? <laughs> the, the, the divine wisdom. This is what King David had this divine wisdom. King David had such a tremendous dose of this divine wisdom that he became Mashiach, he became Hashem's anointed king, and he wrote Perik Shira. He wrote the song of creation, how each creation praises the Almighty, because King David could hear the language of, of each creation, which not only that, uh, King David's great, 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 King David was 2,350 years ago, his grandson, the Baal Shem Tov, that was 300 years ago, the Baal Shem Tov could understand the language of the birds and the trees. The Baal Shem Tov could, uh, did, could see. But if you're that, my great grandfather's Rebbe, the Anuk of Stolen, Rabbi Israel of Stolen, he could understand a horse. He could say when a horse neighed, he knew whether a, a, a human soul was trapped in and reincarnated in the soul and, and, and some reincarnated that horse. And he would he'd see a horse and he'd give a horse an apple. He loved horses. <laughs> and my great grandfather, who was a secret tzaddik, he was a secret the, the Rabbi Yaakov Schmidt. He was Stoner Hasid. He was a Hasid the Yanuka. He was a blacksmith. He was a blacksmith, and uh, he also <laughs> talked to horses. They look like a person. It, the people on high level they can understand language of horse. You understand? You ever th think where someone that has a dog that they really love, or even a cat? They really love. You think everybody, everyone is capable. If you go and you look at the inner dimension of your dog or, or your cat, you can understand them. So how what may enable you to understand the inner dimension of your pet, of your animal? Because you're now looking at the divine wisdom in that animal. Okay? Look at the shit. Uh, you, you look at the David Dome's got a cat, Mango, a uh, dabby cat. Uh, the, the cat sits on your lap, looks in your eyes. The cat he parks with his eyes, and then per you, you can you, you turn, you plug into it, and you don't look at the cat. You you can see, and the same thing would go. If you look at the divine wisdom, you will be amazed. Even on your current level, as soon as you look for the divine wisdom, you're already uplifting yourself, and you see so much more. People think, well, how can these great rabbis? give such perfect advice and how do they know what's happening in the future for them? They see divine wisdom. They, they see what it, they understand what Hashem's doing in the world. And most people, if you read the, the CNN, the New York times, they get all the commentators, CNN, Fox news, they have no idea what's happening in the world. No idea what's happening to it. It's a waste of time to listen to the news because if you listen to the news for somebody that doesn't have a Muna, doesn't know what's happening in the world. He looks at it. Two and two is 22. He sees things on, on surface level and, and makes judgments that are just not true. It's a waste of time. It's a waste of time because you have to look at the message. Look at the message of everything. This is what Rabbi Nachman is teaching us. And Rabbi Nachman says that he, he, Rabbi Nachman quotes King Solomon, the wisest man that ever walked face of the earth. King Solomon wrote the book of Proverbs. Rabbi Nachman quotes the 18th chapter of Proverbs, where King Solomon says, Lo that a fool doesn't want that inherent divine wisdom. He wants the revelation of his heart. What's the revelation of his heart? If you would open up, do a spiritual uh, dissectomy of a fool's heart, you'd see inside there pepperoni pizza and the neighbor's wife and the, the, the money he wants and all this type of foolish stuff and you know maybe a, a chat room and and, and and he was talking with some underage girl, and he was talking with some uh, some married woman. Oh, what I don't even want to describe. But this is what's in a fool's heart. 
because a fool doesn't want wisdom. A fool wants his heart to be revealed. And this is what we learned in our introduction to 13 Principles of Muna on a Muna hour, that it's a war. This is the war going on in the heart between the right side of the heart and the left side of the heart. The left side of the heart is the evil side. The right side is good. Side. This is the same war that's going on in Malchut in the moon. Is the moon going to be light or dark? So when a person acts like Esau and not like Jacob, that Jacob's looking for the divine light, Jacob's looking for the illumination, then connected to divine light. His light, his life is illuminated. When a person connected Esau, looking for the body, the body, the body, the body, it doesn't care. Tomorrow morning, cares what? What's he going to eat now? What's on the table? What's on the menu? Uh, what, what's uh, what's his social life tonight? Nothing past there. And that's what King Solomon says that a fool wants the revelation of his heart, you know, the base desires in his heart. And that is the wicked side of Malchut. That's called the Seter Acha, which means the other side, which means the dark side. This is like Star Wars, the Star Wars, the dark side against the light side, the forces of dark and the forces of light. The same thing. I don't know, maybe the, the original uh, guy who wrote Star Wars, I don't know who wrote Star Wars, Steven Spielberg, I don't know if he did. But uh, I don't know, maybe he read it some uh, some Kabbalah book and try to adapt it with his own silliness. Okay, and this is what Isaiah talks about in chapter 24. And the moon is ashamed. The moon itself is ashamed when the moon is dark because the moon un understands that it has been vanquished by the forces of evil. So Rebbe Nachman, once again, let's say, conclude what Rebbe Nachman says. He says a person that doesn't connect himself to the intrinsic wisdom, that that's the divine wisdom, and that's the life force. Not only is the intrinsic wisdom, the divine wisdom, it's the life force of a person, of, an, of any creation. A person like that behaves like Esau, which as we learned in the Torah, and Esau disdained the birthright. And that's the intrinsic wisdom that we're talking about tonight. And since what King Solomon said, that a, a fool has no delight in understanding, but only his heart be exposed uh, in the Ramak, Rab Moshe Cordovero, he's one of our famous, famous scholars of Kabbalah. And he says, the dark side of the heart, that's the base desires of the heart. Okay, this is where we got this concept from. So this is the evil side of Malchut. The evil side of Malchut is the side of darkness, the side of Esau. It's like a puzzle that all the parts fit. The bright side of the moon, and that's the bright side of Malchut. That's the illuminated side of Malchut. That's the illumination of Chochmah. When Chochmah wisdom shines down on kingship on Malchut, when Chochmah shines down, filters down through the 10 spheres all the way down to Malchut, then it's a connection of good and it's the divine light and it's the illumination, and you're happier, and you're closer to Hashem, and your muna goes up. Okay, so this is what Rabbi Nachman tells us, that we have to connect to the divine wisdom. So understanding, what do most people, what do they do when a person reads Likutei Moran? Oh, yeah, I've learned Likutei Moran. And he knows, he could quote Likutei Moran. Are you closer to Hashem? Rabbi Nachman is telling us it's not enough to learn and even understand his teachings. You gotta connect to the light. We have to connect. There's a big difference between learning and understanding and connecting. Connecting means that I attach my heart and my brain to this light and I commit to this light and I let it illuminate my life. And this is what Rabbi Nachman tells us that a person who connects to this light, connects to the wisdom, which is the life force, then this light illuminates his path in life. Wow. <laughs> All of a sudden, your life is illuminated. So imagine when a fool, nothing that King Solomon is a fool, a fool goes in darkness. It's like a, trying to find your way in the thick woods. You don't know where you are without a compass, without a map, in the middle of the night or a moonless night. He's going and floundering around the woods. These are people that are floundering around life. Ask many people, what do you do in life? What's your goal in life? Well, they say, make money buy a big house, take a Bermuda vacation. How many people have an idea of what their goal in life is? And I take it intrinsically, but I've never told you before, that our book, The Path to Your Peak, it's all based on this principle. 
it's all based on this principle that showing that you are my cherished brother, my cherished sister. You're a soul. You're not a body because your body's here for 70, 80, 90, 100 years. And then current becomes fertilizer. That doesn't make sense. But your soul is a tiny part of divine light. We have no idea of what divine illumination is. It's divinity. So we don't even know the souls within us. But we do know that our life force, that's a tiny spark of the Almighty. Wow. This is the divine wisdom in everything and every person. When you focus on another person and you're looking for that divine spark, you focus on their soul and you look at the divine spark, then you're connecting to their soul. You're connecting to the wisdom, the inherent wisdom that Hashem used to create that person. You learn from the person, you uplift yourself, you become a stronger spiritual vessel. And that's why people that they have love of their fellow humans, they're much higher in spiritual level. Okay. So this is... uh, this is what it says. So we continue on. And but what, what does it mean when you learn Rabbi Nachman's teachings? We learn this and we don't connect to it. It's imagine that you have an appliance, a toaster or a microwave oven on your kitchen counter. Oh, you can't. And, and, and say if you put two pieces of bread in there, it doesn't make any toast. They say, what's wrong with this? Excuse me. Plug it in. Plug it in the socket. If it's not plugged in the socket, there's going to be no electricity. It's the same thing. We have to plug ourselves into divine light, plug ourselves into Rebbe Nachman's teachings. This is what Rebbe Nachman is trying to plug us into the wall socket so that we'll get this divine light. Again, with the electricity. Thank you, thank you, Hashem. Didn't think about calls. So Esau is the opposite of Jacob. Rebbe Nachman calls Esau a fool. All right. Now, Rebbe Nachman continues. He says, we're still continuing on and and Torah Aleph. Zeprinat Yetzer Tov Yetzerah. This is an aspect of the good inclination, pitch battle against the evil inclination. Yetzer Tov Nikra Misken Vachacham. The good inclination is called poor and wise. Why poor and wise? Zeprinat Aniyava Dalad Dalit and Megama Klum. He says, Rabbi Nachman uses Aramaic. And it, it's a, he quotes from the Gemara. He said, because the Yetzer, the Yetzer Tov doesn't have any light of its own. It is an empty, clean vessel. The people say, what's well, empty? Empty, clean vessel is good. Suppose you buy a really fancy bottle of wine for Shabbat. Okay, what do you want to pour that wine into? A clean goblet, a clean crystal goblet. You don't want a dirty goblet. So when we are a clean vessel, we're prepared to receive divine light and we receive it in the right way and it can, it remains pure. Okay, so this is the good the, the good inclination. It doesn't have any light of its own. It knows it doesn't have any light of its own. It knows it's dependent. That's that's Malchut. The holy side of Malchut knows that she's dependent on the light of Chochmah. And she's not a Chochmalog. She's not a wise guy, not a highbrow that she thinks she knows something. She said, no, that she's dependent on either side. I know nothing. I know nothing. She totally nullifies herself to divine light. Now, this is something else. A husband and a wife are metaphor. All in life is metaphors of godliness. The union of husband and wife is a metaphor for the union of Chachma and Malchut. And as Chachma and Malchut, when Chachma and Malchut bind together, Malchut is the receiver and Chachma is the giver. And that's just why when we, in, if you'll read uh, uh, the Bond of Amuna, the Bond of Amuna, we talk about marital peace from to the soul. We talk about how the husband is the sun and the wife is the moon. So people have come to me, guys have come to me and say, uh, Rabbi, my needs haven't been met in a marriage. I said, what are you, a woman? What do you mean your needs aren't met? You have to influence. You're the influencer. You're the sun. You have to meet her needs. Once you shine light on her, she'll shine it right back. The moon, we mentioned in our second lesson, that the moon knows how to great, do great things with light gets from the sun. That watermelon, cantaloupes, all the, the gourd family, they can't grow in a hot house. They have to grow in an open field and light the moon, which we see tangibly in agriculture that uh, the, the moon does great things like the sun. 
So th- this is this is the way it works. Uh, the sun is the influencer. Chachma is the influence. The sphere of Chachma is the influencer. The sphere of Malchut is the receiver. Now, when does Malchut receive from Chachma? Malchut receives from Chachma when Malchut knows she doesn't have anything. And she knows she has to receive from Chachma. But if Malchut acts like Esav and says, Chachma, get out of here, that it disparages, disparages the, the birthright. The birthright is the light of wisdom, Chachma. It says, get out of here, that she remains dark. Because, hey, lady, you've got no light of your own down there, Miss Malchut. You have no light. If you throw Chachma away, you're going to be dark. You're going to be dark. And people that don't want Chachma, their lives are darkness. Now understand why there's so much clinical depression in the world. People, they don't want the light of Malchut. Oh, they, they say, wait a second, why don't you pray to Hashem? Why don't you learn? No, that's not that. I'm going to read anything. There's someone that uh, comes clinical depressed. The person came to me, but they have a, 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 a fellow sibling that's clinically depressed. Said, read this book. Oh, no, they're not going to read that book. Oh, they prefer to be to reign in darkness. This is the power of Esau, where Esau says that it's better that you sit in front of the TV, drink your Coca-Cola, eat your potato chips, have cholesterol up in the air, have a weak heart, be flabby, be overweight, but stay away from the divine light. You don't want that divine light. <laughs> that's Esau. That's Esau. And Jacob says, wait a second, I'm poor. I'm poor, but I'm happy. I've got nothing but I, I, I'm a vessel for divine light. And as soon as I'm a clean vessel, Hashem can't give divine light into a, a trash bin that's full of ro- full of garbage. You have to be a clean vessel. You won't pour a bottle of buy fine wine into a trash bin full of if you paid. 200 quid for a vintage bottle of wine and, and, and pour it into a trash can? That's n- never, never find this. This is what Rabbi Nachman is teaching us. So that's the good inclination, the evil inclination. And the good inclination is called poor and wise. That is an expression that Rabbi Nachman takes from Ecclesiastes, again, King Solomon. Rabbi Nachman is this, so we said in Torah, in Torah Aleph, he so uh, uses so much, taps into King Solomon, because King Solomon's a wise man that walked the place of the earth. Okay, but has nothing of its own except for what it receives from Chachman. Now, on the other side, what do they call the dark side of Malchut? That's called the old and foolish king. The old and foolish king is the old dog that you can't teach new tricks. Thinks he knows everything, knows nothing. Uh, And this is the Malchut of the dark side. We talked about before the poor young lad, that, that's the malchut of the light side. And the malchut of the dark side, the sitra'acha, the dark side, that's the, the foolish and old king. Okay, so the foolish and old king doesn't want intelligence, doesn't want inherent wisdom, doesn't want any poor that. And that is what King Solomon says, that a fool has no delight in understanding. Continuing on. So Rabbi Nachman gives us our marching orders. Rabbi Nachman says every one of us has to give power to the light side, the light side of Malchut, so it can overcome the dark side of Malchut. So what is Rabbi Nachman telling us? Rabbi Nachman did everything in his power to fight that battle. Everything in his power to fight that battle. So what he did... He, he totally broke his own body. Rabbi Nachman was super strong. It was so many times he fasted from Shabbat to Shabbat so that he'd beat his body down. His body was very strong and beat his body down because he wanted to, his soul to overcome. Rabbi Nachman, right before he died, he said, if I would have known that by way of a muna, I could accomplish the same thing, I would have been a little bit easier on my body. Okay, but Rabbi Nachman did that. Rabbi Nachman did that by way of uh, he tortured himself. He, he did it. He wanted to make sure that the power of darkness, the power of unholiness, the power of Asa had no control over him. And this is these are the great Sadiqim. These are great Sadiqim that they totally give total power to soul over body. And they take their body and it's totally nullified to their soul. I see if it, you see that my Rebbe, the Melissa Rebbe, is 80 years old. The Melitza Rebbe runs upstairs two at a time, 80 years old. The Melitza Rebbe eats exactly the minimum what the body needs. They'll see, they'll, they'll, they'll take maybe in the middle of learning his uh, his son that learns with him in a cult. He sits and learns all day long. 
I bring them a couple slices of apple, a couple of bra- grapes, a, a leaf or two of lettuce. <laughs> he takes and it takes it. He takes, spends more time on the blessing than he does on the eating. The blessing before and the blessing afterward. It's completely soul, and that is what uh, that's 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 what we do. Tzaddik Ochel Sovanafsho. King Solomon also teaches us that a tzaddik eats for the satiation of his soul, not for satiation of body. It's to we 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 have the orientation that whatever we do, we could go to work. What why do we go to work? We go to work to to make a living for our family, make a living so we could come home, we could have time, we could have time to pray, we have time to learn, we have time to get close to Shem. But our orientation is getting close to the Almighty, getting close to Shem and not the body and the work and the food and what's on the table. It's just what's on the table. A person that serves a shem. Wait a second. I could have uh let's say I weigh 70 kilos. I could have 70 grams of protein a day. I could have so, so much manganese a day, so much magnesium, uh, so much vitamin C. I need so much energy to get, get through my day and through my activities. Okay, so let's say I need 2,400 calories. How I'm going to get them? What's the best way I'm going to get them? This is what he thinks. He has to think about what tastes good, the bolognese sauce or the, the Thousand Island sauce. Or the, the, he doesn't even think. He doesn't even think like that. He doesn't even think. The only time he thinks like that is for Shabbat, the one day a week where it's a delight. We give the body the delight because on Shabbat, everything, Rabbi Yabbat tells us, everything we eat on Shabbat is godliness. Okay, so uh, until people, if we take in, the advice for body and soul together. Uh, if people are on a diet, Shabbat is a cheat day. Shabbat is when you have a piece of cake. Shabbat is when you can have something nice, something that don't eat during the week, but you're eating for Shabbat. You're eating to delight in the Sabbath and you're not eating to delight in the body. Okay, when you take a chocolate covered donut during the week, that is delight in the body. Delight in the body is dark side. And this is against what Rabbi Nachman is telling us. It says that if we'd follow Rabbi Nachman's advice, all of us would be in good shape. All of us would be in good shape. We'd be eating healthy. We'd be in good shape. We know no extra fat, no cholesterol. And it's a good idea because this is the malchut, the kedusha, that the side of holiness must overcome the dark side. And that's what our sages teach us. Our sages teach us in the Gemara tractate Brachot. Page five, Rabbi Nachman mentions this, that we should always instigate, instigate. In other words, fire up, give him a, like a pep talk, fire up to the good inclination, get over him, overcome him, overcome him, good, good. whack him, go do something, overcome him. And that's what the Darches used to tell us in the Gemara. And that gives the power to the Malchut, the Kedusha. And this is what our sages tell us, lo lam giz. Okay, and that if the Yates, if he doesn't overcome, if he can't overcome, then the evil inclination in his eating or in his speech, then they should drag him to learn Torah, learn Torah with him. Okay, and if then he can't, if he, because learning Torah, what Rabbi Nachman told us to be, learning Torah gives us power to our prayers. Learning Torah, and this gives the power to the light side. That gives power to the light side. So, we could continue on We're trying to run to get another little another little piece finished before tonight. Now we see the magic of what happens when the holy side of Malchut receives the light of Chachma. Chachma is the letter Chet. Malchut is the Hebrew letter Nun. When Nun gets the light of Chachma, it's Chet, it's Chain. And this is the favor. This is the prestige. This is the charm that Rabbi Dov taught in the, in the beginning. As soon as the soul, which is in the holy side of Malchut, it exposes itself to the divine light of Chet Chochma by overcoming and nullifying and subjugating the body, which is the Yetzirah, just like Jacob subjugating Esau, then it receives the divine light of Chet. And a person has charm, a person has favor. And as you look at the big tzaddikim, look at the, 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 the Lubavitcher Rebbe, the big tzaddikim of today, the, the Kloisenberger Rebbe. And I, today I, I have the privilege of, of seeing this with my own teacher, the Melitzer Rebbe, his great grandson, Baal Shem Tov. And I did just look at him and, and look at him. Even sometimes when the Rebbe, when, when the Rebbe pff, he wipes the floor with me if I do something wrong. Okay. 
but it's love him so much. You look at this illumination. It's a divine light. It's, you feel love. You feel happiness. And it, it, just to see him, but first thing you're going to walk in and we pray in the same, in the same quorum, in the same meeting in the morning. If for some of the residents, the Rebbe is right there. And I see if the Rebbe's place is empty, something's lacking in my life. And that's this, because he, he represents, I, I get, it's my teacher. And my teacher brings me closer to divine light. And this is the teacher everyone needs. If you ever have a spiritual guide, the first thing you have to have a spiritual guide is who is his spiritual guide. And his spiritual guide all the way takes up, this is, this is Jacob's ladder. It takes us down here all the way up to Moses. And that's why that, that connects each one of us. We have a, a spiritual guide, not that we don't want the wisdom. Oh, I know everything. That's Esau down in darkness. Jacob, he said, Jacob is connecting to light. And this is one of the reasons that connect. And we'll learn in Rabbi Nachman's teachings, Rabbi Nachman says that we have to connect to the tzaddik. We have to connect to the, to the righteous person. So uh, when we connect to this light, then we get the light of favor, the light of charm. And Rabbi Nachman says, that a person receives the power of holiness by this way. That on the same light, the good people will benefit by it and the evil people will be burned by it. Okay, that's small, that's the dark side because they won't want it. They'll throw it away. So that is, that's our whole ballgame right here. And to the war of Malkut, that the light side of the moon, which is the holy side of Malchut, the illuminated side, this should overcome the dark side. This is the body should uh, should subjugate, the soul should subjugate the body. The soul should overcome the body. As soon as the soul overcomes the body, the more the soul overcomes the body, the more the soul becomes a clean vessel for divine light. Okay, we're going to hold up for now. And until next week, we've got a few minutes for some questions. If someone wants to ask a question, then raise their hand. You can ask a question about tonight's lesson or anything you like. But uh, wish everybody a wonderful week and success. And all your heart's wishes for the very best. It's a secret of creation. And when we get to the end of time, the moon will illuminate the, the sun. The light of Malchut will be complete. Okay, so in the beginning of creation, the moon has to be dark. The moon has to be dark. Otherwise, there's no ball game. Otherwise, there's no two teams on the field. Okay, this is the whole challenge of humanity. This is a whole challenge that to overcome the evil that to and, and we're the only ones on Earth that have both elements of a body like an animal and a soul like an angel. And the Midrash tells us that a person's 120-year-long war is that the angel should prevail over the animal. If it were not like that, then you wouldn't have that war. The moon's light was not diminished. The month, that's the way we say the moon, the moon is the body. The sun is the mal is the chachma. Okay. The moon is malchut. Okay, so the, it could go, the moon could go either way. If the moon gives into body, then the moon is going to be dark. And if the moon gives into soul, then it's going to receive the light of Chachma, the light of the sun. And there will be a thirst. Isaiah says in chapter six, there will be a thirst. Molal is das. Okay, there'll be a thirst for das. And uh, Aliza Wender is going to teach 10,000 girls uh, Noahide laws in Amuna. All right. And uh, they're going to, going to spread. It's going to spread this light, it's going to spread this light. And then when light gets spread, then, then it's going to go like that. It's like what happened. That could happen all at once. Uh, our sages in Kabbalah tell us that it is like, it is a metaphor, is the dawn. If you see the light comes slowly, 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 until the epitome of light is a, is a noon. It's not when the first light. And the first light, mentioned last week, in the first light of the day, you can't see every detail. Okay, you can visualize another thing, but it, that you can see bright details in, in, in noonday sun. Okay? Rabbi Nachman, I'm telling you, I'm telling you. Uh, David, tell you a story from Uman. It's for everyone that you should hear. And this happened when I was in Uman about this before. Uh, you're talking about more than maybe 25 years ago. 
and they first built the mikvah. The tiny little mikvah, they first built the mikvah, and it was about two o'clock in the morning. And there was this uh, Baal Shuva, uh, newly observant Jew, and the guy he was full of tattoos, okay? So a highbrow from Meir Sharim comes in there, and he says to him, well, you're not ashamed of yourself. What are you doing to Rabbi Nachman's mikvah? This is that. With the look at your body, look the way you look. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. So the, the guy answered him. He says, no, I'm going to wear these tattoos all the way up to the heavenly court because I want to show the Almighty where he took me from. In other words, from the sewers to Rabbi Nachman. What a knockout answer. Hold it. Story's not over. And this is, Hashem, let me see all this. So the Meisharim guy goes around, go, goes away, and a Holocaust survivor came in the mikveh, and he pulled up his arm and he said to the Balshuva, he had overheard this also. There were two of us in the mikveh. I didn't know he was at another side of the locker room. He says, "I'm not going to remove my tattoo either because I want to show the Almighty where He took me from too." Okay, that's answered. To, there's. That, that's that's the attitude. The guy loves Hashem so much. Okay, even say sometimes a transgression is greater than a mitzvah because that transgression is done out of so much love of Hashem that he put it. Okay, he didn't know that, that Jews are not supposed to have tattoos. He saw all his buddies have tattoos. What's he going to have a tattoo? He's going to go have it. And then this, this, this guy came to Israel from Russia. He came to Ashdod from Russia. He was in the Russian army. And he's got a tattoo on his chest. He's got a big star of David. I said, man, what a, this guy, he was in the Russian army. Can you imagine his courage? Walking in the showers in the Russian army or all the other, all the Cossacks see him with this big star of David on his chest. And just say, come mess with me. Yeah, guy's a, a big star. You know, if you go, right, but he, he was doing this out of his pride of his people. And you got to look, where, what's it coming from? What's behind it? And sometimes somebody does a mitzvah to knock somebody else down. Oh, well, I'm going to show you that you can't learn Torah like I can. You can't do what I do. You can't do. Okay, that, that, that's that terrible. That's that, that, that terrible. Have to look. This is David. This is exactly what Rabbi Nachman is talking about. Look at the inner light. Sometimes there can be inner light. Everything, there's, there's light. Maybe even a, a non-desirable act, there's light. This is looking for the wisdom in everything. Okay. So the guy, obviously, I guarantee you that whoever made a comment like that to a guy, now I've seen everything, he never opened up Rabbi Nachman's books. Okay, promise. Wonderful story, David. Uh, we, let's do, I'm, I'm looking at it. It's such a privilege to have you, everyone here. We look forward to seeing you next week. And meanwhile, each one of you individually, individually, my blessing for your, your good health, a wonderful Shabbat, success in everything you do, and the smile should never leave your faces. God bless.